So whenever you are ready to start. Lovely, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the first alumni lecture in Trinity term. It's really good to see so many faces here today. My name is Kerry Butcher, and I'm Head of Development and Alumni Relations here at Green Templeton College. Before we begin, I've got a couple of bits of housekeeping to run through. Please note that this event will be recorded, so you'll have the opportunity to watch it again at your leisure. We'll all be muted during the lecture, but we'll be holding a question and answer session at the end. So please submit your questions via the chat function. As usual, due to time constraints, we may not be able to put all your questions to our speakers, but we will do our best. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce our speakers this afternoon, Chris Winchester and Paul Farrow. Chris is CEO of Oxford Pharmagenesis, an award-winning health science communications consultancy that provides services to the healthcare industry, professional societies, and patient groups. He is also an associate fellow of Green Templeton College and a member of the principal circle. Paul is an alumnus of Green College and began studying for his DPhil in clinical pharmacology in 2001. He is now group communications director and Oxford Barnes lead at Oxford Pharmagenesis and along with Chris is co-founder of Open Pharma. Their talk this afternoon is on changing perceptions of industry research. So without further ado, over to you Paul and Chris. Okay, thank you Kerry um, and thank you for the opportunity um, to come back to the college what, nearly 16 years after I graduated uh, to tell you a little bit about uh, what I've been doing uh, over that period of time, uh, a lot of which has been uh, working with, uh, with Chris Winchester. So I'll tell you a little bit about uh, how the perceptions of the farming industry have changed over time uh, and bring it right up to date in terms of uh, how the, the pandemic is also uh, uh, impacting on perceptions of the industry that we work in. So just to, just to disclose that, uh, as you said, uh, we work for a company called Oxford Pharmagenesis. Um, Chris and I are both employees and shareholders of the company. And we provide uh, professional services to the pharma industry, to medical societies, patient groups. Uh, and uh, it's worth saying that uh, the views that we're going to express today are our own. They don't necessarily represent those of Oxford Pharmagenesis or the clients that we work with. So as I said, uh, I, I left uh, the Green College as it was back then uh, in 2005. Uh, I'd spent uh, a fantastic three years working in um, the the old Radcliffe Infirmary uh, in, in, a, in a research group uh, in the Department of Clinical Pharmacology uh, and had a fantastic time working with some brilliant people. Um, I was lucky enough to be working on messenger RNA based therapeutics uh, targeting uh, oncology. Uh, but in, in the second year of my, my DPhil, I'd started to realize that, um, that I suppose the wet science, the working in the lab day to day wasn't really for me um, and started looking at uh, alternative careers affiliated with, uh, with research uh, because I'd spent eight years in academia, really enjoyed it and still wanted to contribute something um, uh, to healthcare. So I looked at things like um, being a journal editor, um, looked at being maybe being a patent attorney, but neither of them really, really, really caught my interest. So uh, I found a, an advert in the New Scientist in the department coffee room one lunchtime, advertising a, a job uh, described as communicating about science and medicine um, from beautiful grade two listed barns in, in the countryside just outside Oxford, uh, which sounded intriguing. Um, I inquired about it, did a couple of interviews, um, took a test and ended up joining what was then a, a very small consultancy of about 20 to 25 people um, working in medical communications. Um, since then, uh, we've grown uh, to be a company now uh, that's global, uh, has offices in North America, Europe, Australia, uh, and there's, there's nearly 400 of us now. Um, but when I joined the industry 15, 16 years ago, I, I'd never heard of uh, what medical writers were. Um, so it was, it was very much uh, a, a, a new and interesting uh, area to be, uh, to be exploring. But it wasn't an easy decision um, to leave academia. And this, this image sort of sums up uh, maybe the way I felt at the time. Um, I got a lot of friends and, and very respected colleagues uh, that I was working with at the time who, when I explained that I was thinking about becoming a, a medical writer, they, they sort of questioned whether that was the right decision. Um, there was obviously suspicion of the pharma industry. Um, and uh, as, I, as I learned more about it, um, people were questioning whether medical communications was just marketing for pharma. Um, and uh, I very nearly didn't, it didn't make that decision to join the industry. But I think um, over the last 15, 
uh, 15 years, I've, I've spoken to people who probably felt the same way uh, in, in leaving academia for other professions. This, this idea that maybe academia is more noble or more pure than, um, than the, the private sector. Um, and that um, and that, that suspicion is there, but I'd argue that the, a lot of the people that I've worked with over the years, um, that sort of suspicion isn't necessarily justified. Uh, there will be um, uh, bad eggs uh, or bad apples in the pharma industry, as there is in academia and other areas. Um, but one of the one of the things we wanted to talk away, about today is that is the perception uh, and trust in in the pharma industry and how that's changed over time. So over, over the last 10 years or so, um, I've worked with Chris um, to try and drive forward best practices in the, in the industry that we're working in. Uh, myself, I've helped develop our um, publications ethics training within Oxford Pharmagenesis and rolled that out. Um, and have also contributed to um, one of the courses at Oxford University, uh, the MSc in Experimental uh, and Translational Therapeutics course where each year I, I give a guest lecture just to explain to students on that course some of the checkered history of the pharma industry so that they have the context um, to learn about the, uh, the best practices that Chris and I are going to talk about for the next half hour or so. So that was, that was all um, uh, up until about 18 months ago, or just under 18 months ago, thinking about it now. Uh, obviously, the world has, has changed very quickly, um, and from a, a, a position of suspicion, uh, from the public, um, the pharmaceutical industry it appears uh, our trust levels in it are, all, are, are at an all-time high, um, and I guess this is this is something you'd expect when we're faced with an unprecedented global challenge. Um, we as societies look towards the scientists, the healthcare professionals, whether they're academia or pharma, um, to try and come up with solutions to deal with the COVID pandemic um, in the form of treatments and vaccines. And it was interesting to see back in January um, at a, uh, a meeting, uh, this is a social media post from that meeting, uh, a meeting of the International Society for Medical Publication Professionals uh, that represents and help train medical writers. Joe Marshall here talking about how uh, trust in the pharmaceutical industry is now at an all-time high. So he was presenting some data from uh, a survey, uh, an opinion poll um, conducted across 11 countries with some 13,000 participants uh, called the Edelman Trust Survey, uh, which showed that 73% of the global, what they called informed public, now say they trust the pharmaceutical industry. And this was a rise of some 13% from the last time they'd run uh, similar questions back in January of 2020, a rise of 13%. So this is, is interesting to see. It's obviously not cause to celebrate because we're talking about a COVID pandemic. But what we do have is, uh, as the pharmaceutical industry, is an opportunity to demonstrate the value that this industry uh, brings to society. And this wasn't lost on, on the pharma executives. So um, in, in a, a lecture given uh, in September 2020, we had Emma Walmsley, uh, the, the CEO of GSK, talking about this was a, a chance for redemption for the pharma industry, uh, a chance to improve their reputation. Um, if pharma delivers on its promise uh, and purpose to find solutions responsibly, uh, obviously with sort of uh, ex with better explanation also of why it's in people's interest that uh, the pharma does this profitably. So if we scroll on uh, maybe nearly 12 months to April 2021, uh, the latest uh, data that uh, Chris and I have been able to find comes from the last few weeks. Again, this comes from another uh, large uh, opinion poll, this time the Harris polls in the US. Uh, it looked uh, at the, the US population um, and asked um, what their opinion of the pharma industry was. Um, they found that um, now, um, as the, the vaccines have been developed and rolled out, almost two thirds of Americans or 62% now give the pharma industry the thumbs up, as they say. Um, so they, they had a, a, a seven point scale. Um, most or 62% or of Americans said that the pharma scored five, six or seven on a scale of one to seven, where five, six and seven are more positive. Uh, and this was quite a stunning uh, jump from uh, back in January 2020, when only about a third of, of Americans rated the industry positively. So quite a, a change. So the, the question that I have, and we'll see uh, where this goes, is will this increase in trust in pharma be enduring? Um, we've all seen the, the sort of the roller coaster of, of news headlines over the last 12 months talking about vaccines, how they've been developed, 
how politics has got involved um, to the to the latest information about very rare side effects and even probably unhelpful comments uh, from our own Prime Minister Boris Johnson about uh, greed and capitalism. We'll see whether um, this increased trust in pharma is enduring. Um, I certainly think it's likely to be different uh, in different parts of the world. But one thing is for sure, and I think Kirsty Graham sums up this nicely, she was involved in the Edelman um, uh, Trust Survey, um, is that pharma needs to continue to build trust uh, and work hard at building trust through transparency. So how, how are patients chosen for clinical trials? How are the vaccines developed? How are the industry's priorities uh, determined? I think this is a consistent message that comes not only from this survey, but from the analysts and, and the commentators involved around uh, healthcare and around industry. So I'm going to pass over to, uh, to Chris uh, to give, a, I guess, a bit more of a historical perspective, Chris, and hand it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Paul. That's really helpful. And it's nice to see uh, the regard, high regard, in which the pharmaceutical industry is held today. But uh, you don't need a terribly long memory to uh, recall uh, when that wasn't the case. And here are just a few headlines from uh, broadsheet newspapers, articles in medical journals, and even a book by a fellow of the college, Ben Goldacre, uh, Bad Pharma. And uh, these really did uh, reflect the fact there was questionable practice in some areas of the industry, and uh, there certainly wasn't the transparency that we all uh, rely on uh, when we're thinking about health. So next slide, please. Uh, and thinking back uh, to that period, uh, Paul and I were at a conference of the International Society for Medical Publication Professionals up in Cheshire in 2011. And uh, one of the key speakers was Ben Goldacre. And in the panel discussion, uh, one of our um, colleagues in the industry was saying that uh, well, we need to communicate more about what we're doing. We need better PR. And Ben said, well, actually, no, what you need is better evidence. And that really hit home for us. And uh, working with others in the industry with a similar mindset, we've actually done our bit to try and address that. And we'll show you in the next few slides some of the, the studies, some of the evidence that we've generated. Next slide, please. So this slide uh, looks at a disclosure performance by industry compared with academia. And it looks over time. So you can see along the, um, along the X axis, the year, uh, and on the Y axis, you can see the proportion of trials that completed in a given year that were uh, subsequently disclosed. And this is an ana analysis we did with uh, um, client colleagues and colleagues internally using data uh, generated by Ben Goldacre and made available for others to use. And so I think we might have been the first to break out industry and academia separately. And what you can see is that back in the mid 2000s, everyone was doing badly. Uh, academia in the gray line was disclosing about a quarter of the trials that it completed. Uh, industry wasn't doing that much better, about 40% of trials. Then there was a big uh, regulatory shift uh, with the US regulator, the Food and Drug Administration, introducing an act, and that led to a step change in disclosure performance. You can see that um, academia went up to above 50%, industry went to 80% plus. I think, you know, we're pretty pleased to see industry uh, performance broadly being maintained. Uh, it's a bit more uh, sorry to see that academia's disclosure performance seems to be declining and perhaps going back to quite similar to where it started. Uh, and we were very pleased. We, we presented these research, uh, these data at um, Evidence Live, a conference here in Oxford. Uh, and uh, it was great to see Ben mentioning research, including research of his own uh, on the same topic, showing that actually industry isn't the main problem, academia uh, actually needs to make progress in this area. And I think that was a bit of a shift in the field. Next slide, please. So the previous data ended in 2015. What's happening more recently? 
This study came from Ben Goldacre and colleagues, uh, data from 2019. And uh, the table on the right hand side looks at the uh, largest uh, funders or um, uh, sponsors of clinical trials in the world's largest clinical trial registry, which is clinicaltrials.gov. And you can see right at the top, the MD Anderson Cancer Center, which has 85 trials completed and which uh, are due to be reported. You can also see only 29 were actually reported, that's 34.1%. So you can see the next uh, couple, uh, next three are also academic and they're struggling to get much above 50% uh, of disclosure. Then you come to the next largest sponsor of clinical trial, and that's um, industry side and 100%, and then above 90%. And when you look at another academic, it's, it's more like uh, 15%, then 100%. At the end, you can see some academic uh, people doing it well. So it can, can be done, but uh, I think we're of the view that uh, industry puts a lot of effort into disclosure now in, in response largely to that criticism that we saw on an earlier slide. And there could be things that uh, academia could learn or has been learning from the industry approach. And I'm going to hand over to Paul now to say a bit more about uh, some of the efforts that we've been making. Okay, so thank you, Chris. So uh, I guess clinical trial disclosure, part of this is obviously posting uh, the, the study design and results on, on platforms like clinicaltrials.gov, but obviously an important part of uh, disclosure and communication of research is, is publication in peer reviewed journals uh, and uh, also at uh, medical conferences. So even before I joined the, uh, the medcoms industry back in 2005, there were groups um, collaborating and working on um, best practice uh, methodology uh, for pharma companies uh, to communicate uh, the, the results of their the company sponsored research. So uh, in 2003, the good publication practice guidelines uh, were, were published, the first iteration. This is now in its, uh, its third uh, publication, the GPP-3 guidelines. And hopefully before the end of the year, we'll see GPP-4 uh, come online as well. Um, really bringing in some of the, uh, the updates around uh, how things are published um, and how things are communicated in a, in a digital world. We'll see that, we'll, we'll see that coming online. Um, but the, the good publication practice guidelines themselves really set out um, best practices for working in an ethical way um, in the collaboration between industry and academia. Um, how, um, how authors work with medical writers uh, and the best practice processes there. Uh, and also uh, for disclosure of uh, financial um, um, information um, that could influence how the results are interpreted. So these, these guidelines are something that we at Oxford Pharmagenesis and across Big Pharma um, follow to make sure that we're doing things in an ethical and, and correct way. But they're not universally known. I'd say that um, knowledge around good publication practice is low within academia. Uh, and within the small biotech companies um, where I, I don't think there's been uh, the same level inve of investment um, that's been seen in large pharma in terms of developing um, whole functions uh, around the communication of their, their research and results. So as I said, we, we, we follow these guidelines um, and um, try and contribute to these guidelines. So one of the things that uh, we encourage our staff at Pharmagenesis to do is propose research ideas um, that will help drive our, our industry forward. And uh, as a result of the, the, the presentation by Dr. Goldacre at the 2011 um, ISMAP meeting, um, we, we listened to that call to arms um, to develop evidence uh, or, or, or present evidence showing the value of what we did. Uh, and we conducted our own study in 2015, um, which was published uh, in BMJ Open in early 2016. And this study was done in collaboration with um, uh, Elizabeth Wager, uh, who was the, the former chair of the Committee for Publication Ethics uh, and one of the original authors of the Good Publication Practice Guidelines and also working with Sally Hopewell, who at the time was working at the University of Oxford's um, Medical Statistics uh, Centre. Uh, and she was involved in uh, the update to the, the consort statement. So for, for those who aren't aware um, the, the, or are not familiar with consort, um, it's a, a minimum set of uh, reporting standards 
for reporting the results of, of clinical trials uh, in publications. Uh, and it was originally developed in the early 90s um, by the celebrated Oxford professor uh, Doug Altman uh, and a consortium uh, really designed at improving the way that uh, clinical trials were reported. So this is, this is one uh, set of standards for reporting research. If you go to the Equator Network um, website, uh, where this is housed, there's something like 450 different reporting standards now for reporting different types of research. But the, the consort uh, statement itself, uh, it consists of a 25 checkpoint item, uh, sorry, a 25 item checklist uh, and a flow diagram um, designed to ensure that you include the, the right information within a publication of a clinical trial so that the, um, the results can be evaluated um, for their validity um, uh, and reliability by the reader and uh, for the information to be extracted from, from these publications and incorporated into uh, systematic reviews. So in the research that, that we conducted uh, and published, we decided to look at um, the, the uh, impact of medical writing support on the, the quality of reporting of clinical trials results as judged um, by compliance with the, um, the consort uh, 2010 checklist. So we looked at whether medical writing support um, improved uh, the reporting of uh, 12 items of this checklist um, that previous research had showed were poorly reported. So what we found um, was that when industry funded medical writing support um, was acknowledged in papers, and these, these papers were published by the, the Biomed Central Publishers, uh, when medical writing uh, support was acknowledged, um, approximately 38% of papers uh, reported at least 50% of the consort ch checklist items of interest completely. When medical writing support wasn't uh, provided in industry sponsored uh, studies, uh, the level uh, of articles reporting uh, these items completely was only 17.9%. So we, we could see a, a, a benefit of medical writing support here. Obviously, 38%, um, there is room for improvement, and hopefully, some of the work that we've been doing uh, since this was reported and, and also highlighting this, I'd hope that the, the levels would be higher now. Now, we also uh, had the opportunity because the Biomed Central publishers uh, use open peer review. Um, we also had the opportunity to um, explore the impact of medical writing support on the quality of written English uh, in these papers. Um, and what we found here was that um, when medical writing support was acknowledged, um, the proportion of articles with acceptable written English um, was about 80%. Uh, so this was acceptable without modification prior to publication. Whereas without medical writing support, only 43% only of papers um, had um, written English of, of the level that would be acceptable without substantial revision or re rewriting. So I think um, in, in doing this, sort of conducting this research, I think we were one of the first groups to um, provide evidence of the value that medical writing support brings um, to the communication of, of um, pharma sponsored research. So I'm going to hand back over to Chris to talk a little bit about um, the other contributions that industry has made to best practices in this area. Thanks very much, Paul. Uh, that's really helpful. So we have um, uh, been involved in other guidelines. So one of our colleagues was involved in good practice for conference abstracts and presentations. Uh, we've engaged with MPIP, which has produced a number of toolkits, etc. And uh, currently we're engaged with some of the societies on tackling predatory journals, uh, which uh, clearly uh, we want to make sure we don't inadvertently, um, as an industry, uh, work with uh, journals that have a dubious uh, business model. And so those are all happening. Uh, but if we go to the next slide, one of the major initiatives in the area has been Open Pharma, which uh, Paul and I co-founded uh, with, uh, um, with Chris Rains and Tim Coda as well, uh, to look at um, how can we advance the uh, publishing of research from the pharmaceutical industry. And we held a meeting at the Wellcome Trust in January 2017 that was chaired by Richard Smith, the former editor of the BMJ. And he asked the assembled people, well, does the pharmaceutical industry have a role to play in advancing the publication of science? 
and we were really uh, quite surprised but pleased to see that people said yes industry should get involved in advancing the publication of science uh, and more than that they came up with some very uh, practical suggestions we didn't have to sweep away the 350 year old publishing model we could actually work with it and one of the recommendations was about open access open access means that content in journals is no longer behind a paywall but is actually uh, available to everyone whether or not they have a subscription or, or are willing to pay and uh, many research funders now uh, publish all their research open access so they say if you take our money then you have to uh, publish the results open access because those funders want the research to have as much impact as possible and the recommendation was pharma should follow the, that lead and so shire was the first pharmaceutical company uh, to mandate that all its research be published open access followed by Ipsen and Galapagos uh, with more we hope to follow. And uh, journals have also um, uh, adjusted their policies to enable industry to publish open access, most notably ASCO, as you can see on this slide. So um, we've got some good uh, traction with open access. We have the next uh, slide, please. And uh, we launched the Open Pharma Position Statement on open access. Uh, which is really seeking to ensure that the highest quality peer-reviewed evidence is available to anyone who needs it anywhere in the world, because we believe that's important for transparency and ultimately has the potential to improve patient care. And so if you agree with that, uh, that call, then please do go onto the Open Pharma website and you can actually sign the position statement and add your voice. We've got over 200 uh, signatories so far. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, in fact, there's been a, a real uh, groundswell um, in the industry. Uh, there's much more understanding of open access now. And you can see in this analysis that we did for Open Pharma, um, how well companies are now doing in publishing open access. Uh, so the uh, Y axis is the proportion of open access. And the x-axis is basically the size of company, how many publications they're publishing. And you can see that uh, in the top left, some of the smaller companies are getting quite high proportions of open access. And even in the uh, right, uh, more than two thirds of publications are being made available open access, which is very exciting. And the Open Pharma members are shown in red, showing some leadership, I think, relative to their size. Next slide, please. So that's open access, but of course, uh, while many people can understand a peer reviewed publication, not everyone can. And so as well as accessibility, we think understandability is important. And so we are currently finalizing some recommendations on what are known as plain language summaries. And the aim of a plain language summary is to summarize a, a re research article bit like an abstract, but in a way that's clearly understood uh, and um, free of jargon, unbiased, non-promotional and easily accessed. So it can be read by anyone around the world and perhaps more people can understand it than can understand a full publication. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, if you want to find out more about Open Pharma, you can visit the website, you can sign up uh, you can, uh, for the blog, you can follow us on social media and you can sign the position statement on open access, calling for open access. And, and um, the blog's a great read. It's very varied and covers all sorts of topics related to open science, uh, not just uh, industry specific. Um, so I think the next slide's my last slide. And it just falls to me to say a big thank you uh, thank you very much to Green Templeton for inviting us to present. Um, thank you to Paul, my co-presenter, and to our colleagues and collaborators who took part in the research that we shared with you today. Uh, please do get in touch if you want to find out more. Uh, I think as Paul uh, hinted at the beginning, this is a fantastic uh, area. It's a fantastic career for people who are interested in implying their science in a different way. 
that can really make a difference in the world. So uh, very happy to hear from you if you're interested. And uh, when we, I know we've got time for some questions now. So looking forward to hearing your questions. Chris, Paul, thank you very much indeed. It's fascinating to hear about an industry that I know very little about. And it's delightful to hear, you know, what the difference it's making. Um, I hope, I'm sure everyone else has enjoyed it as much as, um, as I have. We have got a couple of questions that have been sent in. Um, so thank you to Claire Fisher, who says, how can we influence the policies of the high tier journals, such as the NEJM Lancet, who don't permit pharma open ac access? Well, this is a, a great question and uh, going right in there. Uh, so, uh, you know, historically there wasn't open access, then open access journals came on, on board and then traditional journals started to off, uh, offer open access to funders who insist on it. And so the simple answer is we have to ask for it. And that's the aim of the open farmer position statement. It is an ask we want to be able to publish open access, but ultimately we may have to insist on it. And that's essentially what Gates, Welcome, etc. did. They negotiated with the big publishers and said, if you want to publish our research, then you need to allow us to publish open access. I, I mean, that sounds surprisingly, for those who don't know the industry well, industry doesn't like throwing its weight around in that way. It's used to being criticized and it tries not to upset people, uh, but the way there is now potentially a route to having those negotiations, which are called transformative agreements, where you end up paying for subscriptions and open access uh, altogether. So I think that that's probably the way forward through transformative agreements. Thank you. So another question we have is, do international collaborations give more hope for new drugs against diseases prevalent in resource-poor countries, for example, malaria. Should I take this one, Chris? Great, thanks. Yeah, I, th I think obviously, well, I'd hope, um, I'd hope uh, many in the audience have seen the, the really positive news that's come out of, um, in, in the press over the last few days about the malaria vaccine um, that's de been developed in part through research conducted at the University of Oxford, um, showing that uh, the latest vaccine has the potential to cross the WHO's um, barrier of 75% of something that's, that's likely to be effective. Uh, and I think this is a, a vaccine that's uh, it's been developed with Oxford Research, but also with commercial partners from Novavax and the Serum Institute of India. So I think we're starting to see um, these international collaborations, um, commercial collaborations, uh, along with academia working to, to really show promise in, in areas such as malaria. Um, and I think if, if you look at some of the um, collaborations around COVID as well, uh, you'd hope that these things would, that we'll be able to follow through and, and make a real difference um, uh, to the developing world, as well as those of us who are in um, wealthier countries. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, another question here, what does the future hold for disclosure of clinical trials? I think that's, uh, I'm happy to, I'm sure we can both contribute to that one, Paul, but um, there are some interesting things happening. It looks as if we're getting there, we're getting uh, close to 100% uh, for uh, some of the, uh, the, the more professional uh, organisations, uh, both in academia and in, in industry, so that's really great. Uh, what we're seeing, we've just uh, seen uh, an announcement by the US authorities, the Food and Drug Administration, that they will start to levy fines on people who are not disclosing their clinical trials on time. So I think that's sure to focus some minds in the sector. That's got to be good. And um, I think one of the things that we've been looking at within Open Pharma is what next and uh, one of the issues with uh, clinical trial disclosure is that you end up with uh, information from a clinical trial in many different places. So it can be on a clinical trial registry in multiple different journal articles reporting on different subgroups or different time points. And there's no one place where you can look at the totality of evidence from a clinical trial. So there may be a role for Open Pharma in helping to create a, a platform that links together 
all the information out there, but maybe something that uh, another group like clinicaltrials.gov in the US, which is part of the National um, Library of Medicine, that might be something that they that they would be well placed to do. So they're, they're, that's definitely an area that I see as, as being needed. Paul? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree, Chris. I think, um, I suppose we've spent probably two or three years looking at this within Open Pharma and finding that there's different places for different pieces. E even the, if you think about the, the, the um, clinical trial disclosure evidence, then you've got publications in different places. Then you might have plain language summaries in other places too. Um, there's no real one single source of truth that you can trace it all back to. So um, one of the areas that we've been looking at, again, working with, with Richard Smith and, and others within Open Pharma is how you tie all that information together. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult one, um, but I'm sure somebody will crack it with the use of technology before very long. Thank you. So another question we have here. Why do authors work with medical writers? Chris, maybe maybe I'll take this one as a as I started a, in terms of, I guess my career leaving um, mm -hmm. leaving academia. Um, it's a good question. Um, as as you said, Kerry, uh, and as I found when I joined the industry, I'd never heard of it. I didn't know what a medical writer was, um, and it's one of these questions when you when you start out and your friends and family ask you, "Oh, I've never heard of that. What's what's that then?" Um, but it, I guess the, the the simple explanation is that. Um, the healthcare professionals that we work with, um, the academics that we work with, they're very good at um, coming up with ideas, developing research and, and treating patients. Uh, but I guess as I felt found in, in academia, it was almost like um, writing up your research was what you did in your evenings and weekends and you're in the lab during, you're in the, lab during the week. So um, I'd say that while we have uh, some brilliant scientists, not all of them are that great communicators. There's also a lot of um guidelines that we should be following so I, I used the example earlier of consort uh on the equator network i think it's 458 different guidelines for communicating different types of research um so one of the things that uh, medical writers can bring um through the job and through the training that they receive um is a, a knowledge and understanding of following those guidelines um following the author uh, guidelines that the journals publish because they're often very different between different journals uh, really to try and um ensure the efficiency of the process of communicating pharma sponsored research um, and making it uh, accurate and, and compliant because it's not just about the writing it might be that as a medical writer we we take direction from the authors to help uh, produce the text or produce the uh, the figures that go into a paper um, but the whole other side of uh, a company such as ours is, is project management people uh, and account management people who help ensure that these things go through review processes in a compliant way so that some of the uh, questionable practices that uh, Chris mentioned back in the, maybe in the 90s, uh, that they don't happen uh, today. Great, thank you. Right, we've got another question here from Katie Mello. She says, thank you for a great presentation. In addition to open access publication, you mentioned the need to communicate science in a way that is accessible to all audiences. We often involve patients and the public in academic clinical research, clinical trials, etc. How do you involve patients and the public in science communication? Do you want me to, to take that one? I think... Um... The industry is now doing quite well in terms of what's, what's increasingly called patient engagement. And so we have a specialist patient engagement practice that actually involves uh, patients in uh, study design. Because actually, if we want to bring drugs to market, we need to research them and we need to develop studies that people will actually want to take part in and studies that measure outcomes that matter to patients. So getting the patient voice early in clinical development is increasingly recognized in our industry. Um, and then as we go into the, the communication piece, I mean, I, I might hand over to you, Paul, if you want to comment any further on, on the communication side of it. Uh, but obviously we've got sort of plain language summaries of research, but um, uh, there are a number of things that uh, companies do to encourage uh, patients to take their uh, medication and give them the information they need, etc. Yeah, I, th I think just to add to that, Chris, uh, I think um, you can look to the BMJ as an example of uh, uh, one of the journals that encourages 
patients to be involved in the development of articles and peer review of, of, of articles um, as well. Um, we're seeing a, a, a bigger call for um, patient engagement and, and uh, plain language summaries uh, in, in everything, that we're do, everything that we're doing at the moment. Uh, uh, more and more of our clients are uh, thinking about not just publication of the research in a peer-reviewed journal, but how that is is then going to be made available to everyone, um, not just um, a small group of people um, who are highly qualified in medicine, um, because we know from research that um, that patients are using Google to try and access uh, research um, that may or may not be um, at the right level um, to be accessible. So uh, I think uh, we're, we're heading in the right direction. I think it's just making sure, as Chris described with the, uh, the idea of the plain language summaries being in text form, there's lots of different formats that you can produce these materials in. It's just making sure that we have a, uh, really have a minimum standard um, that we're calling for with, with Open Pharma. Lovely, thanks, Paul. Right, we have another question here from Leto Rebel. I do hope I've pronounced your name correctly, and forgive me if I haven't. You mentioned how substantial relevant training is to ensure clear and transparent writing. In your opinion, what can the university contribute to move towards an improved scientific writing and communication standard in the medical sector? Okay, Chris, maybe if I, I give a first opinion on this. I, yeah. I, th I think, as I said, I think it's um, almost the communication side of it, certainly 15 years ago. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't deemed to be as important as getting on and, and producing the results in the lab. You, you, you spent most of your time thinking about the, the experiments that you do and, and delivering that. Um, I, th I personally think that things like good publication practice should be taught as part of um, even, even undergraduate degrees um, for, for people who are then are gonna move into uh, doing DPhils or PhDs um, and, and medicine so that they've got a good understanding of how important communication of science is at the end of the day if we if we don't uh, communicate the science we may as well have not done it uh, so I, th I think education is needs to be a big part of this um, certainly the conversations that that I've had with Oxford we, we we're doing a small part of that I'm aware that science communication in a non-pharma world is part of uh, is part of the training that people receive um, but I think the the fact that pharma has slightly different has a slightly different compliance uh, rule set uh, means that um, I think we do need to have training um, within academic uh, within the academic world within universities about how to work with pharma because I think as, as I found when I started in this job it's a bit of a shock the difference and uh, you sort of think you're going to be writing all day every day um, communicating about fantastic science but you have to make sure that um, you've ticked more boxes um, in from a compliance point of view maybe than you do in academia and that can be a bit of a shock to the to people coming into the industry but it's definitely worth our place to be i i can just add something i think we really believe in clear writing starting with clear thinking and so i think the oxford tutorial system is uh, is very good at uh, challenging your thinking pointing out ambiguity you know uh, lack of clarity maybe waffle even so um I think there's definitely something, a strong starting point, I think, that, that Oxford has or that the universities have, start with the clear thinking. But we often, as, uh, as students, are thought, taught to think primarily in terms of words. And I think there's a real opportunity to learn how to use images, how to put together a, a good figure, uh, how to choose a relevant, thought-provoking, attention-grabbing illustration. Uh, how do you actually illustrate the main point and bring that out? So that's something that I think, uh, certainly that's one of the th main things that I, I really, that struck me when I became a medical writer. Thought, well, who's going to choose the pictures? Oh, that's me. <laughs> so uh, that's another perspective there. Brilliant. Thank you. And I have one final question for you here. Do you have any advice for someone who wants to get into medical communications? And can I just add a personal one to that? What's the sort of career progression in medical communications and medical writing? What's it like? Okay, um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I can give a, a first perspective on this, Kerry. I think um, w one of the things um, 
we've obviously as, as a company and as an industry we continue to grow and uh, we get a lot of people wanting to join the industry um, who maybe have, have, have become a little bit disillusioned by um, sort of research and post stocking and things like that um, and one of the, the things we occasionally get is CVs that um, they've been put together as though people are applying for their next grant they haven't really thought about the, the career that they're applying for so one of the things I would say to, to certainly get your foot in the door is think about um, what are the skills you, that you're going to need as a, as a medical writer, as a medical communicator and highlight those in CVs rather than just sending on an academic CV, um, but also encourage people to get involved in other um, ways of communicating about science. Um, so I can think of examples of, of people being involved in society, setting up meetings, contributing to university magazines, those sorts of things that show a real passion for communication as well as science. And I think those sort of examples are, are, are what help uh, people make the right first impression with us, but also with other other companies in our industry. In terms of career progression uh, or career paths, um, Chris and I were both trainee medical writers at one point in the last uh, 15, 20 years. Um, I, I guess it's been 16 years since I finished my DPhil, um, started out as a trainee medical writer, worked up through the ranks and I'm now fortunate enough to lead um, our Oxford Barnes office that I showed on one of the slides earlier. So, um, yeah, I think um, I think our company in particular, maybe there's plenty of opportunity for people to come in and create their own paths. I think that's one of the things that, that we'd be keen to tell people about ourselves is that, uh, and Chris can give his own example, is that um, people come in, we've got different practices like patient engagement that people have set up. Uh, really because they're passionate about it so maybe Chris you give a perspective too well I think it, it is a fantastic career I think we do like people who are interested in science and uh, for the medical writing side have a strong uh, research background um, but overall having good interpersonal skills having an interest in making a difference uh, having a kind of a can-do attitude uh, all of those things count and, and make for a very rewarding way of, uh, of doing business. We've got one comment come in here which says, totally agree with this point. When I moved out of science after my DPhil and a postdoc into marketing, it required a whole new way of selling myself and transferring my skills into a language people outside of academic understood. Mm, correct. Well, we just have one last question, so we'll take this one as the last one. Should there be a system of name and shame for those companies who do not publish their trials? I think that that's a, um, <laughs> that's a kind of a controversial question to close with. And uh, actually, I, I do agree. I think um, companies should feel shame if they don't disclose their clinical trials. People take part in a trial. Uh, you know, they, they put themselves at risk taking an unproven medicine uh, for the sake of better human knowledge. And so it's got to be made public at the end. So I would probably say, well, maybe praise the, the good and uh, highlight the bad. Don't just uh, highlight the bad. Uh, there are people doing really well now. And actually, um, Ben Goldacre and group in the Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine have done a great job of building tools that, uh, set in a semi-automated way, show you who's doing well and who's not doing so well. So, you know, if you go to the trials tracker website, you can see, see those, but the FDAAA trials tracker is probably the gold standard, I think. And, and you can see exactly who's doing well and who isn't. And uh, Paul and I keep an eye on it and just keep an eye on how our clients are doing because they need to know if they're, they're slipping for any reason. So. No, so far, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's looking good. So, yes, yeah. good point. The only, th the only thing I'd add to that is that uh, those regulations apply not just to pharma companies, but also to any, any sponsor of clinical studies, and that includes um, universities uh, and, in some, in some places, government-funded uh, uh, institutions. So uh, I think it's, it's worth highlighting that to, to the clients, whether they're pharma industry, whether they are um, uh, academic institutions that yeah. we need to make sure that the clinical trial data is disclosed. Great, well thank you very much. Well, sadly we've come to the end of our time and actually we've gone through all the questions that were submitted so that's been really great that we've had that opportunity. 
So Chris and Paul, can I thank you both very much for giving up your time this afternoon and leading what's been a really interesting session for all of us. Um, and I'd also like to thank all our guests who've been in the audience. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have and taken a few key points away to think over. I'm not sure I'm meant to be a medical writer, but it's given me some things to think about. <laughs> So for our audience, please look out for news of our new next lecture, which will be taking part during our giving day. And there's more information about that coming up soon. So Chris, Paul, thank you very much again, once again, and stay well, everyone, and see you at the next lecture. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Thanks Kerry. Thanks, Thanks you, Kerry. Bye. Bye.